Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, tonight's talk is, is sponsored by the College Scholars Program. This program provides a stipend for, J, for Johnson County Community College faculty for, for J, both full and part time, for the development of two recent presentations, one of which is tonight, and the next one is Wednesday, October, October 5th, 11th. 11th. Where, where, where that Wednesday is? At 11 a.m.? Yes. At 11 a.m. If you really like this one, you can go to the next one. Um, the development of two research presentations in either a guest lecture in another instructor's classroom or a faculty seminar on the topic of their choice. College Scholars was started by Dr. Jim Liker to provide a platform for JCC faculty to present their research projects. Those of us who are involved in this program feel it is very important for several reasons. First and most importantly, it gives college scholar, uh, excuse me, college, uh, community college professors a chance to pursue their own academic interests and to continue to grow and develop in their chosen field of study. This isn't always easy to do when you're a community college professor because, of course, the whole focus of your job is teaching. Um, secondly, programs like College Scholars make for better teachers. Academics who are encouraged to pursue their uh, interests outside of the classroom bring an enthusiasm and a fresh point of view to the classroom that benefits both them and their students. Uh, are there any students from Dr. Antle's class here today? No. Okay. Well, if you were here, and if you were in this class, you would know that this kind of research makes him a better teacher. Um, and finally, I think it is, um, this College Scholar Program is a way for the greater community to get to know the faculty at JCCC a little bit more. Um, community members have attended every one of these talks, and these talks have been going on for I believe seven or eight years now, uh, and have often engaged in a lively back and forth with the pre presenter during the question and answer period. So I'm now on to tonight's speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Jay Antle. Dr. Antle received his PhD in American Environmental History from the University of Kansas in 2003, and has been a faculty member at Johnson County Community College since 2000. As a historian, Dr. Antle has written extensively on sustainability and environmental history and has worked with the Kansas Association of History, the Library of Congress, and the Smithsonian on traveling exhibits and other projects. In recent years, his commitment to environmentalism and sustainability has become even more deep and abiding. He is the host of a webinar series that explores ways community colleges can become more sustainable. He is on the board of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. In 2008, he was a member of Governor Kathleen Sebelius' Kansas Energy and Environmental Policy Group. He is an advisor to the National Wildlife Federation's Campus Ecology Program. And he has been the executive director of JCCC's Center for Sustainability since 2009. Under his leadership, the center has won numerous awards, including the National Recycling Coalition's Outstanding Higher Education Award and the United States Green Building Council's Climate Leadership Award. Finally, Dr. Antle is a Texan by birth and, uh, it, and a proud graduate of community college himself. In fact, it was during his community college years that he first visited Yellowstone and became interested in environmental issues. Since then, he has been a volunteer and a frequent visitor to the park. Uh, and if you ask him nicely, he has a dynamite story about a bear encounter that he might tell you if you ask him nicely. Um, suffice it to say that he has learned firsthand why you should never, never spray your bear repellent into the wind. <laughs> um, he is an avid hiker, a storm chaser, a marathon runner, and a lover of pie. Uh, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Jay Ant. That was uh, Dr. Sarah Boyle, by the way, um, who is the chair of the College Scholars Committee here at the college. So I want to thank her for organizing uh, this, this event in some ways in terms of the selection process, and also uh, Tom Grady and staff development um, for working together on, on a lot of the details. So um, thank you all for coming on a, uh, on a Wednesday evening. 
It's the weather outside is rather calm. Fall is finally starting to arrive here in Kansas. Uh, but today we'll talk about uh, some kinds of weather that while it doesn't happen here often in the fall, it can. So severe weather tornadoes, uh, topography, and, and tall tales. Now, um, my interest in tornadoes goes back a long way. My father was a meteorologist in the U.S. Navy, and so growing up, I talked about weather with him extensively, although growing up on the Texas Gulf Coast, it was really more about tropical weather. It was really about hurricanes. Uh, but when I came to Kansas to go to graduate school, I, of course, got to encounter uh, super cell thunderstorms and tornadoes and, um, to be per perfectly blunt, fell in, I kind of fell in love, really. Uh, for me, severe weather, Yellowstone, sustainability are all part of it. It's an extended conversation with the natural world. So this talk tonight is a little bit of a combination of my vocation um, and my avocation. So I'm a historian by training, uh, but my hobby is I'm a storm chaser. And so here on the left, you see me many years ago when there was less of a helicopter landing pad in the middle of my head. Um, looking at a supercell thunderstorm out in western Kansas near, uh, near Hill City. Uh, here on the right, you see a uh, tornado not too far from Salina back in April of uh, 2012. Storm chasing, and I'll say a little bit about that before I get into sort of the meat of the, the presentation. So, storm chasing, a lot of it is, uh, is like this. I mean, this is us barreling down a road north of Dodge City back in May at about 50 miles an hour, we're looking at this tornado off to our northeast while just off the screen to your left is an, another tornado which is now beginning to dissipate. Uh, this day near Dodge City, we, between Garden City and Dodge City, we witnessed about, I think it was 14 tornadoes. And thankfully, thankfully, almost nothing was hit by any of them. But um, lots of times chasing is not nearly as exciting. It involves uh, waiting, playing Frisbee, and getting sunburns. But on this day, everything did come together. And we'll sh I'll show you some video from another group of chasers on a very deadly day a bit later on. OK. Now, the part of the context that I'm going to go through now with some photographs and video will set up the more scholarly portion of the presentation. Tornadoes are bizarre. Uh, they, they're, they're violent phenomena. They do terrible devastation, but they're also, in their way, starkly beautiful and, in some ways, alien. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in this photograph on the right because I listed it from uh, my own Facebook page, but there are actually three tornadoes in that shot. Uh, this is from um, Hill City back in 2010. On the left, back shot on film, remember that? Film getting it developed is a, what we call a rope tornado, which is a, the, the end stage of a tornado's life. Not every tornado has a rope stage, but this one did, near Columbus, Nebraska, back in June of 1998. You are going to see what that tornado looked like earlier in its life cycle a little bit later on. But to be clear, tornadoes are not that bizarre. And if any of you ever afford me that image, I'm going to strangle you. How many of you have seen this? Okay, well, most of you don't know why I'm ranting then. Anyway, you, you know the grandfather who forwards you the weird stuff and says, did you see this? This was in Iowa yesterday. Right? Yeah, so anyway, tornadoes are weird, but they're not quite Cthulhu weird. And the fact that none of you got that reference meant I just wasted about half, 30 seconds of your time. But just laugh and humor me, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to show you one of the most famous videos in storm chaser history, even though this gentleman's not chasing. He's actually shooting it off of his front porch in Columbus, Nebraska. This is the tornado that became the little rope that I showed you a minute ago. We call it the crazy farmer video. You're about to see why. Tornado was right there, and his 
not moving to the left or to the right, but you're going to conclusion, what does that mean? He might be coming right at you. Susan, where are you? Susan's down in the basement. back out la, 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 la. and he sees this probably about the time where I come on the scene way to the south. Swirls in that thing. Oh, the door open. It changes at any time. Oh, shit. What's happening in this so-called road stage, which we Life cycle is the main vortex of the tornado is becoming detached from the parent thunderstorm and the thunderstorm itself like is gone. Like and then the ambient winds around the thunderstorm can sort of twist and stretch um, the whole vortex. That's what's here. happening here. Umbilical cord? Yeah. That's good. Almost gone. It's the tail now. Long tail. Oh, it works. Man, did it get hot. My gosh, did it get hot. Oh, look at that. No wonder we had a tornado. Crazy Farmer video. Do you get it now? Why is the Crazy Farmer video? Okay, now a very different tone to this video. Um, this is actually a storm that I also chased, but I am thankfully nowhere near where these folks are. Joplin, Missouri, May 22nd, 2011. 158 people lose their lives. More than 1,000 are injured, many seriously. Um, the reason I'm going to show you this video is this also shows you the, how amazingly violent and quickly tornadoes can form.
in case it's all believe, the louder you shout, the more exciting the video. Pick it up, I can't film! I'm talking, I can't film! I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it. Stop, 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 okay. stop. We need stop. to look up on the right. Yes. Move your head, Isaac. Move I got it on video. I'm oh, getting it. Your man. Man. Move your head, stop, stop, stop. Okay, we need your adoptions if we want to stay with it. I got lightning so If you're driving along and you see that, what is that? A lot of people in Joplin, including me, because I'm in Joplin right now, I'm driving through the middle of downtown, heading south into the area that gets nuked by this, and I look off to, the, uh, to my west and I just see blackness. I see nothing that was distinguishable. Uh, so tornadoes can form and they can get large and violent and very quickly. They, be, they take on alternative forms very quickly. Their life cycles are all very bizarre. And so that's why I think we on the Great Plains had to develop this whole rich set of stories about tornadoes and, and topography. This is a photograph taken by a friend of mine, Gene Moore. What's that? If you read descriptions of the 1925 tri-state tornado, which is probably multiple tornadoes, which killed over 2,000 people, the descriptions read something like this looks. This is not your Wizard of Oz little needle cute tornado. This is something else entirely. So. Whenever we talk about tornadoes in the Great Plains, we need to understand we're talking about a wide variety of phenomena that takes all sorts of shapes and forms. And so, again, we shouldn't be surprised that we have all sorts of stories that try to explain why these things do what they do. Uh, tornadoes come from supercell thunderstorms. And uh, this is an example of an, what we call a low precipitation supercell. Taken by, this is one of my photographs, taken back again on print film. Uh, from Ray, Colorado, back in 1999. And you can see that this storm might just be rotating a little bit. Uh, you know, those, those illustrations come from it. It's a sign of updraft rotation, a supercell thunderstorm. If this storm was going to produce a tornado, it would probably be coming out about, right about here. Another supercell, uh, the Texas Panhandle, from actually back in this, this, this early May, and this, to me, suggests just why a lot of us go out and, and storm chase. It's not about tornadoes. It's about scenes like this. It's about the landscape. It's about the colors, the shapes you see in the sky. That's the same storm a bit later. And then after the gust front passed over, you have this area behind it that we sometimes call the whale's mouth. And that's what happened when that passed over. So uh, the, the, the storm chasing on the Great Plains provides you all sorts of opportunities to see things you wouldn't otherwise see. And I will say all, this also about the storm chasing and particularly severe weather, really odd things can happen like that. Not often, thankfully, but you have to worry about the safe puff marshmallow man from time to time. OK, well, in Kansas, we, of course, have a long history of tornadoes. Many of them, most of them, thankfully, are short-lived. And they're rare, and they aren't terribly violent. But this state does have a history of those that are. Udall, Kansas, 1955, there on the left. Uh, that tornado hit about 11 o'clock at night, uh, 80 deaths. On the right, uh, Andover, Kansas, April 26, 1991. Uh, that, you see, is part of the remnants of the Golden Spur Trailer Park. Greensburg, 2007 before and after uh, from, from Google. The tornado at various at, at points in its life cycle was almost two miles wide. Uh, a friend of mine, Mike Umshide, who's one of my storm chase partners, is the weather service meteorologist who actually gave the warning for Greensburg, which gave him about 20 minutes before the tornado actually hit. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to a, this is Greensburg. I don't know if any, any of you have ever been to a town that you thought you knew uh, after a tornado was hit. Because when you go, it's probably it's true of hurricanes to some degree too, right, Christy? You think you know landmarks, you think you know where you are, and then suddenly you're in the middle of this mess where the landmarks are gone. 
And there's a kind of disorientation, which is really hard to describe if you've never been through it. All right, now we'll get on to the more sort of formal comments that I have about my, my scholarly research associated with all this. Here is a photograph from Clay Center, Kansas, north of Manhattan from 1973. In September of 73, Clay Center and a few other communities in that part of the state were impacted by a series of violent tornadoes. Uh, many of them were rated EF3 and EF4 on the Fujita damage scale. Thankfully, there were no deaths, but there were several dozen injuries and millions of dollars worth of damage, including to the Clay Center Hospital. Now, what tends to happen when you have a big tornado event on the Great Plains is they, the locals publish either a commemorative newspaper or a book or a magazine about the event. And what I discovered in the archives one day, when I was just kind of fooling around looking up with what we had in Topeka at the Kansas State Historical Society archives on tornadoes, I came across this. The Indian was wrong. That's the name of it. And I, of course, looked at that and went, what? I then asked, because I was still relatively new to Kansas, I then asked some folks at the museum, what did this mean? And suddenly, here came the folklore. Here came the tall tales. Clay Center had a story that back, you sort of imagine some, some gentle sort of music playing from a bad Western movie, right? You know, when the pioneers first arrived, they were met by local Indians who said, oh, you will be safe here from the big winds because there are valleys, or it's a river, or it's the hill, and the story varies, depending who you talk to. And Clay Center would be safe. And so this happens, and the title was, The Indian Was Wrong. And then, of course, I began asking around, and discovered that almost every town on the Great Plains has a story like this. The most famous one, of course, in Kansas is Burnett's Mound in Topeka. Here is a Potawatomi Indian uh, chief, uh, Abraham Barnett. Um, there are variations as to how the story is supposed to go, how the legend was created, but this is one where I'll give you the consensus version. That uh, this, this gentleman said that as long as the burial ground of my people on this mound is undisturbed, there will be magic which will keep Topeka safe from tornadoes. Okay. Now, by the 1950s, this idea had become so entrenched that a, a gentleman named Snowden Flora, who worked for the Weather Service in Topeka, actually had to begin combating it in newspaper articles. Despite the fact that Topeka, had, the outskirts of Topeka, and even some small portions of the interior had been hit seven times by 1954. And then, of course, comes 1966, June 8. A large, violent tornado comes into Topeka, right over Burnett's Mound, and uh, almost wipes out Washburn University and throws debris on top of the Capitol Dome. Two days later, an article appeared in the newspaper and when people were asking, what happened to the mound? What happened? And one response was, well, you know, they did build a water tower up there. It's impossible, of course, to know how many people actually believed this. But nonetheless, it was in the culture that somehow disturbing that mound disturbed the, the magic and then Topeka was hit. These stories are everywhere. Uh, some versions of the story say that when two rivers come together, the big winds will never come. Salina and Emporia have variations of that story. Both places have been hit. Uh, some people say the story is that there's a valley because tornadoes just bounce over the valley. And so in Waterloo, Oklahoma, they had a story like that too, until 1947, when an F5 almost wipes out the town, kills 100 people. And a survivor of that event named George Getzinger goes to Oklahoma A&M, which is now Oklahoma State. And he tells his story to his classmates about how, despite this story, his, his town was almost annihilated. And his classmates come back with stories too that, yeah, the old Indian told, my, told our grandparents story after story, place after place. And so Getzinger writes in his journal, that same damn old Indian must have been going around the country lying to everybody. 
Wichita has a variation of this story. They ask the Arkansas River. That'll keep them safe. How many of you heard variations of the story before? Right? You, most of you have. I, I, actually, I'm surprised. Less than half of you have. Maybe they're going away, but these stories exist. Um, my favorite one of this that I've heard was this tiny community up uh, not too far, off, far from Fall City, Nebraska. I was chasing one day, and my serpentine belt went. So I kind of limped into town and came across this classic institution of Plains Life, the combination auto repair place and feed store. And uh, so all the local farmers are, shoot, are shooting the breeze, and I, I come strolling in, and, he sa- and uh, they say, what are you doing here? Who are you? What's up? Uh, oh, I'm storm chasing. Oh, son, son, you're in the wrong place. We have rivers on both sides of town. We're safe here. Now, it's very difficult, again, to see how many folks actually believe and act on th- those stories, but they are ubiquitous. And so as a historian, I began to ask the question, so where do these stories come from? How do they originate? And I first started off by looking at what do we know about what Native Americans were actually saying about this stuff. And the place I was looking would be at what early white anthropologists were writing when they were talking to uh, groups like the Kiowa or the, uh, or the Osage, the occupants, the Native American occupants of Kansas and Oklahoma and Nebraska at the time of white settlement. Now, of course, there are problems with those kinds of sources because you're looking at things through a white anthropological lens. So there are some methodological issues here. But there's a pretty clear understanding in the literature that Native Americans aren't telling white settlers, this hill will keep you safe. What What they say is that tornadoes, severe weather, are part of a larger world, an animate universe, which occasionally takes on a kind of consciousness that people can interact with through ceremony and ritual. Example here with um, Mankaia. This comes from the Kiowa. The Kiowa probably have the densest set of stories about tornado. And what you see here is something called the Silver Horn Calendar, which is kind of a, a version of a, what you might have heard of a, called a winter count, which Native, American, um, Native Americans are marking the year with certain symbols, certain descriptions, so they can later be recalled when stories are told about the tribal history. This one has Storm Maker Red Horse appearing twice, and uh, this gentleman here comes out not very well for the experience. Now, the Mancaia story, there are variations of it. The version I like to tell is one that's kind of uh, boiled down a little bit to its essence by M. Scott Mamaday in his book, Way to Rainy Mountain. The story goes something like this. The Kiowa were running out of horses. So the shaman were consulted, they gathered together, and they decided they would make horses. So they took the famous red clay of Oklahoma and infused it with the spirit of the universe through this very complicated ritual and there's a part of me in the back of my head when I tell the story, I always sort of flash back to Frankenstein. And as the ritual and ceremony goes on, then suddenly the, this, these, these creatures begin to move and, and writhe and whinny and grow in size beyond the control of their makers. And they ascend into the sky and they ascend above the clouds until all that was left of them that could be seen were their tails on the ground. So the story goes that the Kiowa are not afraid of tornado because tornado, Mankaia, speaks the, their language. Tornado, you shall pass over me. Mankaia, you shall pass over me. Those are the kind of stories that we find in the literature that Native Americans are saying about this kind of phenomena. Not that you people are safe if you settle here because of that river. Now, I can't say that there isn't some Native American that, didn't, that ever said that, but that's not the majority of what's being said. Native Americans see tornado as part of this animate universe which is full of creatures and spirits which you have to deal with through ritual, ceremony, and proper respect if you and your people are going to get by in this world. So, um, I've been looking at this stuff for a long time, but for this particular project, I was able to take advantage of modern technology. And you kids in this, here's, here's my old man moment. You kids in the room doing research, I hate you. I hate all of you. 
Because you can just go online and do a keyword search, and it's, it's, it's all there. There's no microfilm. There's no, there's no microfish. There's no blood coming out of your eyes after seven hours. Of... <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm better now. I'm okay. But for those of you who do this kind of work, this is from the Library of Congress. This is a big project called Chronically America, by which lots of papers across the country going as far back as 1690 had been digitized and are keyword searchable. So I began to search for tornado, Kansas, Indians, to see what actually was out there. Now, I've done some of this before, but by the nature of the source material before these databases were, were put together, it was, very, it was very surgical, and I wouldn't call it comprehensive. You can also, as a Kansas resident, uh, have access to even a larger database from newspapers.com if you go through the Kansas Historical Society website. So those of you who are into genealogy, you can look at this. So the two databases that I looked at that added some depth to, to this, this story. And I'm happy to say, that even though I've been talking about these issues for a while now, um, the research that I did at least convinced me that I would, had, I'd always been right. Um, but, but now I have more de detail to make my case. And so I began looking at all of these pieces. And what would tend to happen after a big tornado event is you would have Newspaper pieces about the event, deaths, injuries, the data, sometimes very macabre descriptions of what happens to bodies, which seems to be a 19th century thing. And then there would be usually some sort of scientific pontification about why things went the way they were. Uh, you know, and not a, bit, a lot of it will see will go into pseudoscience, but so there's a lot of this stuff out there. <clears throat> and what I'm discovering, and what I discovered, is that looking at all these stories about tornadoes in the past in newspapers, no one's talking about Indians. No one's saying that uh, Indians told us this in 1867. There's none of that stuff, none of that shows up in the 19th century newspapers anywhere. So then where do these stories come from? That this hill or this valley or this feature will keep town X, Y, or Z safe if it's not from a Native American attribution. Well, I decided to do a test case, particularly around a set of tornadoes in 1879 that got national attention. What you see here are the damage paths of multiple tornadoes from North Central Kansas from this May 1879 outbreak. Um, and Irving, Kansas, was basically wiped off the face of the earth um, by not one, but two tornadoes within half an hour of each other. And this event got national attention for reasons that I still cannot fully understand. Scientific American does a cover story on them, um, and uh, the Signal Corps sends out a man named John Finley to write one of the most important early books on tornadoes, because of this event. And theoretically, Dorothy Gale comes from here. Uh, there's, a, there's a family of six wiped out, the Gale family, and there's some speculation that L. Frank Baum may have been inspired by that to use the Dorothy Gale for Wizard of Oz. I will rant against the Wizard of Oz later on, just hold on for that. So there are lots of articles out there about how tornadoes and cyclones behave. Uh, here you see one on the left from 1896, one on the right from 1860. And so all of these pieces are, saying, are talking about magnetism, sunspots, electricity. Nothing about rivers or Indians or that sort of thing. And by the way, this form on the left here is a fairly traditional sort of form of this. There'll be some, some doctor, some professor, who will then go off about his opinions, and then the uh, paper will print them. And oftentimes, multiple papers will be printing the article across Kansas. So potential causes, here we see an example of one of these pieces from the uh, Osage City Free Press, Sunspots. Um, there's a, a self-published book out of Lawrence by a guy named Ted Weissman, 1885, talking about the importance of electricity. Uh, the Aurora Borealis, okay, magnetic fields. Um, there is some discussion of topography, but 
not in terms of topography keeping a place safe or not safe. There is some discussion about damage, about how, how damage can be more intense because of topography, but not that topography will keep you safe or not safe. Barometric pressure, vacuum, we'll get to the vacuum thing a little bit later on. So all these things are mentioned in these fairly frequent pieces, but nothing about topography keeping a place safe. So here are two perspectives uh, from the 19th century. Because the point I want to make here, and maybe the way I can make this point is to go back to this. I'm going to argue, and I do argue, that pioneers in the 19th century in Kansas develop these stories based upon what they see. Based on what they see, and then those opinions are reinforced by people who are supposed to be experts. The Indian attribution is going to come later. So let's look at those paths. And actually, the real tornadoes themselves are much smaller than those red lines. But just look at that. Look at that. The area not hit is immensely larger than the area hit, right? Or let's be even more elemental about this. Which is bigger? Here or there? What's bigger? What's bigger? There. There is bigger because there is everything except what's here. Now you can define here however you want. Here can be your town, here can be your farm, here can be whatever matters to you. So should we be surprised from a mathematical perspective that we never get hit here and there always gets hit? We shouldn't be, but people don't see the world in a mathematical grid. People see the world and what matters to them. Why don't we get hit here? Well, you know, they all seem to go north of here, don't they? Yeah, they seem to. While north can be 2 miles, 5 miles, 10 miles, 20 miles, 100 miles. And you know, between here and there, there's that ridge, right? And in the 19th century, how are people placing themselves in the landscape? Today, we say where we are based upon where we, the road we're next to. Right? We're down I-70, or we're on Metcalf. In the 19th century, people used topography to place themselves on a mental map. Rivers, mountains, hills, Hogback Ridge, the Big Blue. So given all of this, we should not be surprised that people begin to confuse correlation with causation. We, as human beings, do that all the time. In fact, we're, that may be one of the things we're the best at as human beings. It's confusing correlation with causation. And then we have people like this dude. You can tell I'm going to have fun with him, right? John, Professor John the Weather Wizard Tice. You know, this guy sounds like he should be on some small town TV weather station on the weekend, right? Tune in to the Weather Wizard. That's funny. <laughs> Come on, people. So here is Professor Tice from Washington University. And if any of you are from there, hang your head in shame. <laughs> Maybe you went there. This is, this is not a fine, one of your finer moments. Uh, so Professor Tice writes a response to a woman from Waterville, Kansas, who was freaked out by these 1879 tornadoes, which killed some of her neighbors. One can understand why you would be worried when that happens. And, and, and she asks, Mrs. Galpin uh, asks uh, Professor Tice, um, you know, is Waterville safe? And Tice writes back, oh, madam. Tornadoes have a great affection for water because they are very thirsty. Generally, they bound along like a ball, no sooner touching the ground than they rebound. And so this goes on saying, you guys in Waterville are doubly blessed. You got hills on one side, you got a river on the other side. So it'll either bounce over your town or it will take to the river and miss you all together. This is the expert. So people are already beginning to make assumptions about topography based upon their own observations. And then you have the expert saying, yeah, topography matters. And oh, by the way, he then comes along and says, 
tornadoes are electric phenomena, and that's beyond controversy. We're going to have fun with that one in a minute, too. Okay, and then we have John Finley. So Finley is America's, really, in my mind, first real tornado expert. Comes out of the U.S. Signal Corps, which will eventually become the Weather Bureau and then the Weather Service. Finley comes to Kansas, and you can find in newspapers across the state, Finley, in the wake of that 1879 event, asking people to write him with their descriptions of what happened, where the tornado went, what they remember from the, that day. And then he goes to the towns affected like Irving and does damage surveys that look relatively modern. So then Finley publishes a book on this, which I actually own a copy of, which is really interesting. And Finley and Tice engage in the occasional newspaper battle. Because Finley has no patience with some of this topographical idiocy, as he calls it. Um, now, this is from the Iola Register. And this is, not, this is not something that's written by Finley, but it's partially inspired by him. Professor Tice, as a weather prophet, may be set down as a humbug. He never gave the least intimation of the late tornado that passed through his own state, destroying hundreds of lives and thousands of the property. The professor should take down a shingle and turn his attention to matters that he knows something about, for it is evident that he is not in direct communication with the clerk of the weather. Tice, for example, argued that a tornado that hit Delphos back in 79 did what it did because it was following the electricity on the telegraph wire. And Finley then writes publicly, the problem with that idea is that that telegraph line was only on a map. It was never built. Burn. OK, so these stories I'm arguing begin to develop, into, develop natively by white settlers themselves based on what they see. And then the validation comes from people like Tice, and this becomes sort of entrenched in the culture. Now, I want to make it very clear. I'm not saying these people are dumb. They're not. There's a lack of experts who can explain why tornadoes do what they do. Even Finley is struggling to explain these. And, and can you understand in that video I showed you earlier why people have a really strong explanation, a really strong need to know why these things do what they do? If you're living on the Great Plains and the town 30 miles away is wiped out the face of the earth, you want to know why. And you want to know that you're going to be safe. And so there's a real psychological imperative for these stories to become established so that people can come to terms with the place where they live. So where does the Indian attribution come from? I've only found two references before the 19-teens. One, to a speech by state Kansas Senator John Ingalls, and I cannot find a date on it, but it's probably in the 1880s or 90s. One reference. And then I find it, first time in a newspaper that can reliably date, from the Osage County Chronicle, June 4th, 1903. It's an old Indian tradition about Burlingame that owing to the peculiar protection offered by the hills about the town, I'm thinking about Burlingame, hmm, okay, um, that it can never be visited by a cyclone or tornado. And here's the key part. The Indians had their own special lines of knowledge, and some of the matters pertaining to nature were ahead of the white people. Whether they are right or not, there is no means of knowing, but it's hoped that they were. It's a comforting sort of tradition anyway. What happens in the 20th century, and if you're a historian, you know this, Native Americans become increasingly romanticized in terms of their views of the natural world. Once Native Americans are no longer a threat, once they're on reservations, once, once the Indian wars are over, then you have this very simplified romanticizing of Indians' views and use of land. And that's playing in to all of this. And so by the time we're in the late 19-teens and 20s, the same period that Indian relations with nature are being romanticized in American popular culture, Boy Scouts, is when this attribution seems to happen. I can't explain the mechanics of it, but that's when it happens, and that's, I think, why it happens. OK, now we're going to go through some fun stuff that I discovered along the way. 
Because in Kansas, how many of you have talked to your relatives who say, how can you live there? You're going to die. Right? Early boosters of the state were in a constant battle with detractors arguing that they really aren't that bad here. Um, the Leavenworth Weekly Times was particularly worried about this, and so there's a series of pieces in the wake of that May 79 event in which he is fending off attacks from the East. And I love some, this one here, the Tornado Belt. The Tornado Belt, which our friends in the Eastern states put in Kansas at the time we had one storm last May, seems to have now located permanently in New England and has just been given another exhibition of its power, which will be seen by details given later this morning. By the way, our eastern neighbors haven't had anything to say about the tornado belt for some weeks. In other words, so whenever a tornado happens someplace else, these papers jump on it and say Kansas is not the cyclone state. The east, that's where they are. Because you don't want to scare off people who might want to come to Kansas. And then Missouri. Ah, Missouri. So what we have here is that Civil War sniping that continues in between newspapers on the Kansas and Missouri side of the state line, even over things like tornadoes. So this takes place between the St. Joseph Gazette and the Atkinson Champion in June of 79, again in the wake of that big outbreak. The Missouri papers complain that Kansas is taking advantage of the publicity to say good things about their state. <laughs> right? So in other words, people pay to Kansas, and so those damn Kansas talk about their wheat harvest or whatever it, whatever it is. And in response, the editor of the Atkinson Champion, and I love this language, right? If some sort of cyclone could be got up that would tear around through Missouri in a discriminating sort of way, conducting its operations with judgment and dispatch, and maybe selecting among its victims those who think the James boys were heroes, Missouri would have a just reason for feeling that the cyclone was a public benefactor. The problem, however, is that a cyclone does not revolutionize a rock-rooted and moss-backed public sentiment, and that's what ails Missouri. We are afraid, therefore, that even a cyclone won't help her. And there are some uh, folks who argue, um, at, you know, maybe it's a point of pride uh, for the people on the plane. This, this comes from the Iowa Register. Well, it's printing is something that comes out of Iowa. I think it's just a great, great stat. With a great piece, excuse me. With all of its superior culture, New England, New Englanders, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. New England makes a miserable failure every time it tries to imitate a Western tornado. The best they can do in that line is to break it down and maybe drown somebody. <laughs> Perception again. Now, when you see people talk about tornado data sets, understand. These are really corrupted data sets. I mean, by corrupted, not, not, not that someone's altered them. But there are now, every summer, so many people like me out there that weren't out there in 1952. So as you go forward, you're going to have these numbers be go, going up as averages because there are more tornadoes being reported. But beyond that, what can you tell me about the pattern you see in this map? Because there's a pattern. The darker the color, the more tornadoes. Hmm? Well, okay, there is that. And there is there something to be said for where what we call the dry line tends to set up in the spring. So there is a maximum of tornadoes further west. But what about these counties? Sherman. Why would there be three times as many tornadoes in Sherman as other counties? What's in Sherman County? Not much, but there's something. Goodland. More people. Which means more people get to see them. 
So here's a case where if you weren't actually looking at the data very closely, you would maybe assume maybe towns cause tornadoes. I mean, you see what I mean here? So you have to be careful to not get correlation and causation mixed up. But over time, I will tell you that these data sets will, will change. And by the way, the average tornado count in the state of Kansas, I think now is up to about 58 or 59 a year on average. Uh, it's probably more than that because of the data set. But they're, they're rare, even in Kansas. Uh, there was a weather service meteorologist who estimated, and this may be conservative, that every acre of land in Kansas, this is a guy named Joe Schaefer, and I cannot imagine how he calculated this, but he argues that every acre of land in Kansas will be hit every 2,500 years. And most tornadoes are weak and might damage your roof, but won't do much else. Thankfully, less than 4% of all tornadoes are the Joplins and the Greensburgs. And remember, these ideas become entrenched in Kansas and Plains culture when the state of tornado science was pretty primitive. And in some ways, it's just now becoming, coming out of that primitive period. Finley's really the pioneer. Let me give you an example about the scientific state of affairs with tornadoes in the 1840s. This involves some enterprising scientists, a cannon, and a chicken. So this Monty Python-esque experiment uh, is conducted to try to figure out how fast wind speeds are inside a tornado. Because everyone knows that a tornado causes chickens to lose their feathers. So how do you replicate chickens losing their feathers? Well, you stick one in a cannon. You can imagine how this experiment goes. R.I.P. chicken. And, uh, and somehow they actually come up with an estimate which isn't too far off. They came up with, I think, of 500 miles an hour, which is actually better than the estimates you saw in the 1950s in engineering manuals, which thought it was more like 2,000 miles an hour. But that's the state of the science. I mean, the first true tornado forecast, as we understand that term, was not done until 1948 in Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. Two enterprising uh, Air Force majors are brought in by their commanding officer at Tinker Air Force Base after the base was hit by a tornado. And you can see this happening. The commanding officer says, you boys, tell me the next time this is going to happen. You can see that conversation, can't you, if you've been in the military? <laughs> the maj uh, these guys' names were Fallbush and Miller. They go back to their office and go, mm. So they come up with a detailed set of conditions that happened when the first tornado hit. And by some bizarre circumstance, about three weeks later, they start checking off the list. Southeasterly winds, trough along. Today? And sure enough, a tornado actually hit the outskirts of Nika Air Force Base. Now, that is so incredibly bizarre in lots of ways. I mean, and of course, they aren't able, you aren't able to forecast that precisely. But the point is, that was really the first local tornado watch, if you will, in American history. That's 1948. That's not that long ago. When did we discover the jet stream? World War II. So these ideas about topography mattering happened in a period where the expertise about meteorology is incredibly primitive. And of course, you know, you stop a radar. Those have only been deployed now for less than 30 years. Now, what I want to conclude with I've gone on a little bit longer than I probably should have, but that's what happens when I talk about severe weather, um, is modern myths. Because part of the story is old ideas that stick around longer than they should have. How many of you remember getting to the southwest corner of your basement? Eh. Uh, that actually comes from that 1879 outbreak. Um, there was a survey done, of, of how, a very small survey done of homes that were damaged, and the corner that seemed to have the least amount of stuff in the basement was the southwest corner. Fast forward to Topeka, 1966. A KU meteorology professor by the name of uh, Joe Eagleman does a large survey of damaged homes, and guess which corner had the most stuff in it? Southwest. But yet that idea, once entrenched, 
was very hard to get rid of. And by the way, the real answer is just get downstairs under something substantial. That's the answer. Or spend three grand on a steel reinforced concrete closet, which will guarantee your safety. How many of you remember open your windows before you go to your basements? The idea behind that was that tornadoes generated an intense vacuum which would cause your house to explode from decompression. No. That's in my like 1965 childcraft. No. Right? <laughs> Absolutely what it said. Maybe, but still no. <laughs> Because we now know, thanks to folks getting probes in the tornadoes, that uh, the pressure inside one is low, but it's not low enough to cause your house to blow up. And more importantly, you don't need that for your house to blow up. Because what's going on? Winds are blowing bricks around at 200 miles an hour. That's really all you need. How about this one? This one's new, too. Get under an overpass. That one was born and bred in Kansas and has killed people. April 26, 1991, footage you've all seen of reporters allowing themselves for some odd damn reason to get caught by a tornado on an interstate. That takes skill. Tiny tornado moving 40 miles an hour. You're in a car going 80. <laughs> anyway, they're caught. Or should I say they stop? And you know, part of it is a human reaction, they want to be safe, right? And so they get under what they think is a shelter. That's really what it is. They, just, they really want to be safe. And they get under a shelter, and the video makes it appear that tornado hits them, and they're safe. The tornado misses them. They're hit by an inflow jet. Scary, but not, not deadly. That video goes mainstream on what was then sort of the beginning of, not really social media, but it was reality TV. Those t desperately horrible shows after local news at 6.30, right? You remember those? So this happens, and it goes national. And so May 3rd, 1999, I-35, Shields Road, Oklahoma City. People are under an overpass 18 minutes before a tornado arrives, and they die. Don't get under an overpass. But you've all heard that, right? You've seen the video. So uh, these things get entrenched and the heart of this lodge. Oh, this one, Tornado Alley, right? Where is that? Here. Is it? OK, is this going to move or is it not going to move? OK. So just watch where the tornado frequencies are at various times of the year. Is that Tornado Alley? Is that? What about that? My point is the ways we try to categorize nature are never as complex as nature is. If you've heard about Tornado Alley and you move down here to Mississippi or Alabama, are you going to buy a weather radio? Are you going to buy a steel reinforced cloth that costs you four grand? Why? It don't happen here until one comes to Jackson, Mississippi at four in the morning. And down here, they do. Up here, we're lucky. We have to have daytime heating most of the time for us to get strong tornadoes. Down there, in the in December, January, February, they don't have to because the moisture and the heat's right here. And the jet stream is rocking in that, that time of year. So what makes the Great Plains different, though, and there are differences, is the combination of frequency and violence. So there is something distinctive about the Great Plains. But it actually, if you do the entire nation and look at what parts of the country have most tornadoes per square mile, it's here and there. People like Michael Jordan can exist only because people like me exist. But the point is that a lot of things that we think about tornadoes are much more complicated than, we, than, than the, we, the way we tell stories. We tell stories because we want to make sense of the world. And people came to the Great Plains in the late 19th century 
were scared out of their minds by this bizarre phenomena and created stories that made sense of the world and made this a place safe for them to settle. That's where the stories come from. So with that, we've covered a lot of material, and I've gone on longer than I should have. But uh, I'll pause now or stop for any questions or comments you might have. And thank you all for coming out tonight. A couple of funny slides that I forgot about. Oh, I forgot about this one, yeah. Famous tornado on, on film, one of the worst things that ever happened in the state because everyone thinks Kansas is this, because of the film. And oh, by the way, just uh, my shout out to Katie Horner. All right, questions, comments? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a tornado class that you've been home? No. Because you're never at home, you're always out there. Well, there's a joke in Lawrence whenever, that whenever I'm not in Lawrence, people in Lawrence should be worried. Because actually, this is, this is funny. Here at the college, I'm chasing out, in, out near Dodge City, and a tornado hits our farm here on campus. It was weak, but that sort of you know, fits the motif. Other questions or comments? Yeah. So I think the electricity thing that's mentioned in those newspaper articles is really interesting because growing up in the Gulf South, my grandmother taught me that when a storm was coming through, you had to put on rubber sole shoes. Because if you didn't, you were more likely to get hit by electricity or lightning. So that, that whole story that y'all have here is very similar to what I was taught. Some of you might remember there was a, a, even a theory that if you put a uh, storm was in the area and you turned your TV to one of the snowy channels, it would do weird things before a tornado hit, right? But you know, in the, remember in the 19th century, electricity was far more mysterious than it is now, with potentially wondrous property that we were just discovering. So it made sense that in the absence of, of evidence, you would turn to electricity to explain things. Yeah. Jake, um, you know, a hundred years from now, what kind of what kind of absurdities will scientists think about the way we understand the science of tornadoes? I mean, do we do we literally know it all at this point? We do not. So, so the, way, the way to answer that, the, the, for me to, to tackle that question is where is the research going now? Yes, because it seems to me that, you know, aside from the, from the poor idiot out at Wash U, there, there are concerted attempts to try to make sense and to understand. So the science doesn't strike me as necessarily corny when it comes out. So what are no. we saying now that in 100 years it's going to look... Well, well, I don't know the answer to that, but I will tell you what we're working on now is trying to figure out why certain supercell thunderstorms produce tornadoes and other ones don't. Because you can have... We, we have a very good sense now as to what the general atmospheric conditions are that create severe weather supercells and tornadoes. What we can't always tell is why the supercell A produce and supercell B doesn't when they're only 20 miles apart. So that's where, that's cutting edge research. It is, and the sad thing about that is that there is no guarantee we will ever be able to predict that to that level of specificity. But, you know, we have gotten to the point now where Doppler radars can, can detect minute circulations uh, that we couldn't five, 10 years ago. And it can, it, can, it can even now show damage in the atmosphere, in, I'm sorry, debris in the atmosphere. And so you uh, can oftentimes tell if there is a tornado or not, not just based upon rotation, but upon their foreign objects in the air. So that's a real innovation. Duo polarity Doppler radar over the course of the last couple of years. But the challenge will be being able to figure out why does storm A produce and storm B doesn't, even though they're both dropping hail the size of a golf ball or you know, baseballs or whatever. Other questions? Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily a question, it's an observation about the, the topographical features that are supposed to protect you from storms. I used to have a uh, children's book mm -hmm. about a certain farmer who didn't like the mountain next to his farm. He had it removed, and all sorts of bad things happened. And one of the last things that happened was a tornado. 
his wife got on him because she said, well, you know, the hill protected us from the tornado. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, uh, just a story, but this was ingrained even in children's mm -hmm. literature at the time. Yeah. So. Well, you should never remove a mountain, right? There are, that, that's just bad karma. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Anything from, from, from the ladybird contingent in the back back there? Yeah, questions, thoughts. Not be subbed in. <laughs> that was actually on the spur of the moment. Not bad at all. Well done. Um, I, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter if you're if you're Mr. Korea, so you're still being sucked in. And by the way, this notion of sucking in is also a little bit exaggerated. Tornadoes do have some vertical motion, but it's mostly radial. I actually have a real question. Okay. Um, is the majority of the damage caused by the force of the wind or the stuff that is being carried? Um, mostly by the stuff that's being carried. But arguably, it's really, it's really kind of hard to distinguish between the two. Um, but if you have objects that are being thrown around that have serious resistance to them, that damage then something can, can get uh, magnified. I didn't show you any of it here, but if you want to see some amazing damage, disturbing damage, some of the things that Joplin Tornado did, um, are truly unbelievable. Uh, so imagine a curb cut like this with a 2x4. Somehow a 2x4 went through the curb cut. And again, this is why people are trying to explain these tornadoes and what seems to be capricious behavior because you can have that and then a block away a home more or less being untouched. Not untouched, but, but not seriously damaged. That's because in these big tornadoes, you have lots of small vortices circling around a big circulation. And if you get lucky, you might lose part of your roof, but your house might still be there when your neighbor's is gone. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, and many of your historical research, going back to the 1800s, early mm -hmm. 1900s, was there ever a religious component attached to that? The preacher saying those people deserved it because of bad behavior. You you find that sometimes you don't you find it obliquely referred to, but you wouldn't find that so much in the newspapers. The newspapers are very sober in their assessments, and they're very attempt they attempt to be very pseudoscientific. And any explanation that begins to talk about these superstitious, at least in these papers in the you know in this time period I look at, are really kind of mocked pretty quickly. Now, I don't know what's happening in, search, in churches. I don't know what's happening in sermons. But in terms of what's coming into the public discourse, that stuff's not showing up in a way that I can find it. But I'm with you. I'm sure there's somebody somewhere saying that. Now, of course, the, the, today what we get is, and this has always bothered me a little bit, is in the wake of a big disaster, people saying, well, God saved me, right? Does that mean that Got, hmm, right? Uh, there was another, yeah. Uh, just a, something I seem to have observed throughout, you know, living in Kansas, most of it. Whenever we have a tornado warning and we're told to take shelter, it seems to almost always be in the late afternoon or the oh, I'll have to go, this is what we're going outside. That's all I'm doing. Finish the oh, story. Right. But it seems to almost always be in the, late afternoon to the evening, yeah. is, is there something to that, or is that a case of they're not going to call a tornado warning? No, you need, as I was saying earlier, because of the, of the, the way, uh, time of year where the jet stream is up here, the jet stream is weaker, there's less upper level energy, and so you need more instability generated by daytime heating. And so you need to have instability build up to the point to generate and, and sustain these thunderstorms, and that ten, tends to be after 3 p.m. through about midnight. There are exceptions, but that tends to be the case. Yes, ma'am. So you take those like beautiful pictures of the like, supercell coming in. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you know where to be? Did I ever be twister and sand and no? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's geeky in front of the computer time. Look at the pretty colors on the computer models. You teach yourself how to do broad scale forecasting. 
And so then you know a week out when there might be a severe weather day where it's probably going to be, and you adjust your forecast accordingly, get yourself there, and see if you're right. Um, when I was, when I was first yes, there was, at 10.30 in the morning. Yeah, and oh, yeah. I heard a lot of different like, reasonings behind it. The main one is that two tornadoes collided. But I know. <laughs> what, Go I, on. I just wondered what the scientific like, explanation for that was. A microburst happens when you have a big dump usually of rain-cooled air. That's heavier in the air around it, hits the ground, and as a result, air is displaced, and here we go. That's what happened there. Um, and in fact, I remember that morning very well in Lawrence. Got a phone call from a friend of mine on the west side saying, there's stuff flying around in the air, should I be worried? Because once you hit the weather guy, people call you, right? Now that's on Facebook, right? What the heck's going on? And you, and so I walk outside in time for that gust front to hit my front yard, and I watch a neighbor's tree collapse. That storm was, as we say, slightly elevated. It wasn't quite getting surface-based instability yet. This is one of those rare mid-morning things. And that storm got its act together on the northeast side of Kansas City and dropped tornadoes all the way to Lake Michigan. It went along a warm front all the way to Lake Michigan. So that was an extraordinary event. But it wasn't caused by two tornadoes colliding, or aliens, or anything like that. OK, I'll take one more if there are any. If not, we'll call it. Anything else? I'll hang around for a while. Thank you all for putting up with me for an hour. Thank you all for coming out.